The greatest trick that the enemy ever pulled was to get you to believe that he didn't exist. Right? Because if he can get you and I to believe that he didn't exist, then we can run amok of our life. We can do whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want, and however we want. Right? And then, like, there's, if the enemy doesn't exist, then, then hell doesn't exist. Right? But the truth is, Satan is real, and so is hell, and so is the demonic realms that are attacking us each and every day. He's got demons working overtime, and he is on a mission to kill and to steal and destroy. And like I said earlier, not just believers, but even unbelievers, right? So whether you believe or not, he is after you and he is after me. He's not just some cartoon character that we see on TV at times, right? With a pitchfork and horns and a spiked tail and he's fully red. That's not him. And the Bible is clear about who he is. As a matter of fact, there's 24 names that the Bible gives him that I will show you here in just a second. But who is Satan? Satan is a fallen angel. Right? He is Lucifer, one of the three archangels. There was Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. He was the angel of worship, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. But he started to get a little bit into himself. He, he, he started to, 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 you know, feel like, you know what, I, I want to be praised. I want to get the glory that God is getting. So he got jealous of God possibly a little arrogant. And instead of being a worshiper, he wanted to be worshiped. Not today, Satan. That wasn't going to happen. And so because of that, God casted him down with a third of the angels who ultimately became demons. Now, because you and I are made in the image of God, you better believe that Satan hates you and me. Because we're made in the image of God. Right? So he's after you. He's after me. And because of that, we will be attacked. It's not a matter of when. It's every day. Every day there is a battle. Every day there's something coming against, especially those that are followers of Christ. He doesn't take any days off. He doesn't take a vacation. And he knows you and me. He studied us. So if you have a biblical worldview, then you know attacks we face are from Satan. This makes life easier because if you partner with this, you know that the battle isn't against flesh and blood. It's not against your baby mama or your baby daddy, okay? Although you want it to be sometimes and you want to give them a good one sometimes, right? It's not against your, 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 your boss or your coworkers, right? It's not against your ex, your kids, your parents. It's not against your step-siblings. It's not against your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not against your brothers and sisters in Christ. The battle is against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us this, right? I'm sorry. That's not what it says. Not today, Satan. I corrected myself real quick. The battle isn't against flesh and blood, thank you. Correction, right? But it's against the powers of the dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we could understand that and believe this at all times, you and I would be so much better for it. You know what else would be better for it? Our relationships, right? Our relationships with people would be so much better if we believe this, and I know there's tension right now, don't ignore it, right? Don't ignore it. The enemy wants you to stay there. He wants you to be burdened. He wants you to, 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 to have a hardened heart. He wants you to be frustrated, and he wants you to be angry, but not Jesus. And we need to hear this today. The enemy is trying to attack from the top down and from the inside out. He's trying to attack our homes, our spouses, our kids. He's trying to attack us in your immediate family and in your extended family. He's trying to get in everywhere he can, including your church family. 
Look at your neighbor right now and tell them, watch out and stay alert. Our hope in this series is that you would be equipped for the battles today, tomorrow, and the ones to come. Because let's face it, the body of Christ is under attack. God's word and his truth is under attack. Christianity in a whole is under attack. But do not lose hope. We already won. Amen? We just need to stay steadfast. Don't give up in doing good, the Bible says. Amen? And continue to fix our eyes on Jesus. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Listen, if you thought the enemy was just some character, look at the 24 different names that the Bible gives as the enemy for some of the characteristics and who he calls him to be. Serpent, Lucifer, Satan, tempter, dragon, devil, deceiver, right? There's all these different names. And today we're going to focus on his character as deceiver. Someone say deceiver. deceiver. Go with me to John eight forty four, And it says this, he, who is he? The devil. This is what Jesus says about Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding on to the truth for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and a father of all lies. So anytime he speaks, it's a what? It's a lie. Because he cannot speak the truth. So right from the jump, we see his strategy. When you open up the word of God and you go to the book of Genesis, you see this serpent from the jump already being who he is, a deceiver. And he starts to attack. What does he attack? He attacks the authority of God's word. He's being who he is, a deceiver. So if you're taking notes today, I want you to jot this down. Number one, the deceiver questions God's word. In Genesis 3.1, here we see the serpent with Eve, right? And he's just slithering around. And here he comes to tempt Eve. And in Genesis 3.1, we read, now the serpent uh, was the shrewdest of all cre uh, creatures the Lord gave uh, God had made. Really, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? Notice, the deceiver didn't deny that God had spoken, right? He didn't deny that. But what did he do? He questioned what God had said. He tries to speak doubt. Somebody say doubt. Yeah. And he continues today to try to speak doubt into you and to me about what God has to say in his word and his truth. He is a deceiver, right? And he's trying to deceive us in areas of our lives like greed and dishonesty, right? He's trying to get us with pride, and, and all the reasons why we think I have the right right now to be so prideful. Well, look at what they did to me. And look at how they treated me. And look at all those things. He's trying to get us with sexual immorality. And there's so much underneath that umbrella. Adultery, homosexuality, gender identity. And he's trying to deceive us and get us to question. Right? And we hear things and we're like, what is happening? That is not how God created things. We hear about, you know, or, or we, 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 we get challenged and deceived and, and hatred and unforgiveness, idolatry. There's, there's so many things, but he's trying so hard to get us to indulge in our sinful nature because you and I, we are fleshly at times. Satan is a liar and he is the father of all lies. And anything God prohibits, we know it's for our 
good. You hear that? But Satan wants us to question the goodness of God always. He always wants us to question the goodness of God. So jot this down. When you start to doubt if God is truly good, it becomes easier to go against what God wants for our lives. Deception. Deceiver. You see it all around us today. It happens in my life, in your life, happens in the world that we live in. We are sinful by nature. And there is instruction in God's word and how we ought to live, right? And what we should be uh, participating in and, and, and our character and, you know, the, the, the goodness of God and what he wants for us. And, and it's not because he's a killjoy God. No, it's because he is a very loving God. And, and you can, if, if you are a parent in here, you really, really understand this, right? If you truly love your children, you truly understand this because you don't want your kids to do anything that's gonna harm themselves and hurt themselves. And we've seen this in our children. We tell them, don't do that. And then what do they do? They do that. And then what ends up happening, right? We're there to pick them up and to say, it's going to be okay. And sometimes I've said, I told you so, right? I shouldn't say that, right? I remember when I was young, I've told this story before for some of you that are new here, it's probably going to give you a good laugh. I remember my grandma, you know, back in the day and my grandma's uh, 1985 Honda Civic, you know, that thing was a box, by the way, four seater. I love that thing. And it used to be this cigarette thing. Remember they used to have those back in the day, you'd stick it in, it'd get hot and then you'd be able to. So, so I remember I told my grandma, can I put that on my nose? And she told me, no. And then when she wasn't there and she wasn't looking, I stuck it in, pulled it out, put it on my nose. And it was during the winter break. And it was actually, no, I was at school and it was Christmas time. And they called me Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And I think I learned my lesson, right? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Right? There are things that the Lord instructs us, right? God instructs us in his word because he knows what comes after it. God is so generous. He's such a good God that he would leave us instruction, not to try to just figure it out on our own. This was the command that God gave them in the garden. Ready? When you go to Genesis 2 before Genesis 3, you hear this from God. You may freely eat any fruit in the garden except for uh, except fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely what? Die. Okay? So they understood this. To the point where Eve was like, I, I can't even touch the tree. Right? They put parameters. Right? They put boundaries. Somebody say boundaries. boundaries. Man, and that's another thing that I was thinking about was I was studying is like there are people that I've seen that have grown in their faith from spiritual milk to, to eating that, that hard food, right? That, that just, you're, you're getting stronger in the Lord. You're getting wiser in the Lord and you're setting boundaries, right? And I've seen some of you guys talking to me about relationships and right away I set these, you set these boundaries and parameters and you knew from the jump that person wasn't for me because I said, if this isn't how they are being in, in this relationship, then I know for sure that's not for me. And you wouldn't do that before, but now you've done it and it's saving you a headache, amen? It's saving you the pain. It's saving you the shame. It's saving you the, the hurt that comes with that. Are you with me? So we, we, we see that in Genesis uh, 2, and then let's jump back and fast forward to Eve's response to the serpent Satan, okay? Genesis 3, 2 through 3, of course we, meet, we may eat it. The woman, or of course we may eat it, the woman told him. It's only the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat it or even touch it or we will die. So we, we clearly see the serpent who represents Satan tempting Eve to question God's command by asking if they are allowed to eat from any tree in the garden. It's his tactic. He is deceptive. He wants to undermine God's word. And he wants to do that today to you and to me. But guess what, church? 
There is freedom in his truth. Amen? There is freedom. And he wants that for you. But the beautiful thing is, is he's given us a decision to make in life. He gives us a choice. Amen? And sometimes we choose what's right. And sometimes we choose what's wrong. Number two, if you're taking notes, it's going to lead me into number two. The deceiver will twist God's word. What does the serpent respond to Eve with in Genesis 3, 4 through 5? You won't die, he says. The serpent hissed. Oh, I hate snakes. The serpent hissed. God knows that your eyes will be open when you eat it. You will become just like God, knowing everything both good and evil. Someone say like God. That is what trapped Eve. Right? It was that deception. Like God. You will become like God. Satan is constantly doing this to God's people. All up in your ear. Deceiving you. Doesn't matter what you do. He's a loving God. Go ahead. Smoke it. Pop it. Watch it. I mean, I don't know what some people do. Pop, lock, and drop it. I don't know. (laughs) If you're married in the context of marriage, y'all do whatever you want to do with that. (laughs) This feeling of not wanting to miss out on something, sometimes that, 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 gets within us, right? Remember that killjoy God that we're talking about? He just doesn't want me to have a good time. (laughs) He wants you to have an amazing time in the context of his truth. He wants you to be liberated and set free. He wants you to live an abundant life, the word of God says. But we take that away from us when we don't choose his ways. Here's the warning, church. Anytime you compromise your faith, there will be consequences to come. There always is. And there's no shame here, right? There's no judges in here. We are not to judge. But we know that when, when we cross boundaries, there are going to be consequences to come. And the enemy is quick to attack with shame. Genesis 3, 6 through 7 says, the woman was convinced. She saw that tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it gave, it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves up. This always happens when we fall into temptation and cross boundaries. The enemy hits us hard with shame. And what do we try to do, church? We try to cover it up, right? We try to cover it up. It's not a new tactic. It's what we learn from, from our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, right? It's covering up the shame, right? So why did they do that? The animals didn't care that they were naked. God didn't care that they were naked. Why were they hiding? Why were they feeling this way? Because they were hiding from each other. Sin will always affect your closest relationships. If you're hiding something from your spouse, a parent, a friend, a confidant, somebody close, maybe you have a closet that nobody can go into. 
It's, it's sealed, it's, it's locked shut. Maybe you have something tucked between your mattresses that nobody knows about. Maybe you have a bank account that's hidden, right? Or maybe like a hidden place where you stash money, or maybe it's a URL that you continue to delete, or, or maybe a thread where it's text or a DM, and you've gotten really good at doing these things, right? I can promise you every single time that this happens in your life, you are going to feel shame. You are going to try to hide it, and you think you running scot-free, but eventually the truth will come to light. And when it does, there is going to be some pieces that are going to have to be picked up. There's going to be some healing that will take place. And let me tell you, God can do it. Amen? Amen. But why get to that place where you get caught? For some people, they're, they're happy because they've just been in it for so long. And it's been killing them inside, but it's almost been an addiction in whatever that is. And so when it comes out, they're almost, that, that's a point of freedom and liberation because now it's out. It's not hidden anymore. It's not a deep, dark secret anymore. Don't get duped by the enemy. So what does Adam and Eve do? They try to hide from God. Genesis 3.8, when the cool evening breeze were blowing... The man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Some here right now, whether you're sitting in these seats or you're watching online, some people are hiding in plain sight. Again, I have to clarify this. There's no shame in this room. Hear me for what, I, what I'm trying to say. We are hopeful that today some people are going to wake up. Yeah. Amen? That you are going to come out of this place of complacency, this place of addiction, this place of pain, this place of shame, because God loves you and he doesn't want you to stay there. Yeah. And he has more for you. The more is there, we are just suffocating it out. And I've seen it before, people coming out of these things, right? And they know who they are and their identity is back in Christ. And they start to move with the Lord and you start to see a shift in their life. And you start seeing them come alive because they are living in purpose and serving for a purpose. And it's a beautiful thing. And you better believe the enemy knows the, the things that you are capable of and the way that God has gifted you. So he wants to minimize you in any way possible. And he wants to anchor you. And he wants to shackle you. And he wants to hold you down. But God. Amen. Someone say, but God. He wants to set you free. The Bible says who the son sets free is free indeed. Amen. So how do we come back the enemy and his deceptiveness as he tries to deceive you and me every single day? Many of you already know this. It's through the word of God. Amen. Someone say the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And where do we get this model from? We get it from Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. As Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and here comes the enemy to come and to tempt Jesus. Again, it's Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. So 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. I fast for half a day, and I am like super vulnerable sometimes. <laughs> Especially when I drive by on North Main and I see Burger King, I see McDonald's. I see Taco Bell, I see Wendy's, I see Chinese food, I see Ikebana's. You, I mean, I don't have a problem with food at all, you guys, but I'm just telling you, 
You know, how do you know all those things? Oh, I grew up in Salinas. Across, there was the old Roy's, and now it's, I don't know, but there's some good seafood there, amen? La Costa, con todo. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) So for 40 days and 40 nights, can you imagine, like, you know, but there's strength that comes in that. There's strength that comes in fasting, right? It takes us off the things of the world and fixes our eyes and focuses our faith on Jesus, strengthening us in our faith. And there's some powerful things that can happen in those moments, and your prayers are so powerful. Amen? But Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights, and remember, he is fully God and fully man. So the temptations that you and I feel in our flesh, in our spirit, the same temptations that he is feeling. So here he comes, the devil, coming in, and he's going to tempt Jesus not once, but three times. He tells him the first time, if you are the son of man, turn these stones in to bread. And I want to pick it up in Matthew 4, chapter 3. Then the devil came and said to him, If you are the son of God, change these stones into loaves of bread. Verse 4 says, But Jesus told him, No. And what does he say? The scriptures say. Okay? He says, no, the scriptures say people need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. So that was the first time, right? And then the enemy, in verse 5, the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off for the scriptures say. He's quoting Psalms 91, 11 through 12. You better believe the enemy knows scripture better than you and I. And so he's quoting it to Jesus, but he quoted it Uh, correctly, which he said it correctly, but out of context, right? And for the wrong intentions. Sometimes we do that. Let's just be honest. And we do it to the people we love the most, right? We've said it before. Married people, you have thrown scriptures at your spouses at times, right? And it wasn't for a healthy reason, right? And, And if you have a very smart wife like my wife, she'll quote it right back to you. What if I don't want to love the way that Jesus loves the church right now? <laughs> right? That happens. So he, you know, he, his, his posture is not, his heart, you know, this, this whole uh, way of him coming forth is, is, is not with the right intentions. So he orders, uh, he says, he orders his angels to protect you. And they will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. Jesus responds, the scripture also say, uh, scriptures also say, do not test the Lord your God. Amen? It doesn't stop there. Verse 8, next the devil took him to the peak of the very high mountain and showed him the nations of the world and all their glory. He says, I will give it all to you, he said, if you will only kneel down and worship me. What does he respond respond with? He says in verse 10, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, someone say, for the scriptures say. For the scriptures say, say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Verse 11, look at what happens. And the devil went away and angels came and cared for Jesus. Amen? When we resist the enemy, he must flee. So how do we combat it? With scripture. When was the last time you read your Bible? By yourself. Not in church. Not in a venture group. Not in a Bible study but by yourself. Think about that. And the only thing that I want to say is this. Get to know it so that you know how to combat the enemy and his wicked schemes. You know how bank tellers 
um, notice that th- this is a fake, right? You, you, know, you know what they do? They don't study fakes. They study the real thing. They touch it. They feel it. They smell it. They lick it. No, I don't think they lick it. <laughs> right? That's just you and your Jordans. Get, just get over it already. They're going to get dirty, Okay. So, so they, they do that. They study it. They look at every single detail in it so that when a fake gets placed in their hand, right away, they can already feel the texture. They can smell it. They can see the little details that are off as they studied it, right? And that's the same thing for you and for me. When we study the truth, we know how to combat the enemy's deception. And when there are people in this world that are coming against what we believe. This world is very anti-Christ and it's becoming more and more evident. And so what are you going to choose and what are you gonna stand on and what are you going to choose to believe? But can I just say this real quick as an asterisk? When you choose to believe God's word, remember the most basic things about Christianity that sometimes we forget about and we wanna become so good in his word and we wanna know scripture and we wanna know it from front to back and all these things, but faith without works is dead. And let me tell you something, okay? The word of God tells us to love the Lord Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. The battle isn't against flesh and blood. Amen? Amen. It isn't against the people on social media that disagree with you. You're wasting your time. You know what your time is better spent in? Praying for them and their posture and what they believe. And praying and digging deep into the word of God. Amen? The most simplest things. I don't know why we keep coming to this church and they keep talking about love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You know why? Because we still have a hard time doing it. It's the simplest things that make such an impact for the kingdom of God. We have been sent and called by God to do great and mighty things, to build the church, not tear it down. And we have a testimony, and it's important that you and I guard our testimony. I am so grateful for God's grace and God's mercy. Amen? Amen. There are times that I fail too. We don't stay there. We get back up, and we continue to follow until he calls us home. Amen? Amen. Until he calls us home, you have a purpose to live out. So you can either choose God or deny him. You can live freely in his word or do what you feel and what you want and what will please you. But know this, if you choose that route or the other route, it will always affect those around you whether you are a stepping stone or a stumbling block, it will affect those around you. So here's one of my big challenges. If you have a closet, if you have a mattress and something in it, if you are hiding something, it's time to come out, amen? It's time to say no more. It's time to say, here I am, God. I surrender to you today. I've been hiding with fig leaves. I've been trying so hard to hide this from my family, from hiding it from my spouse, from hiding it from you, God. And it's burdening you. It burdened me. I know that feeling of shame and guilt and what it's doing to the people that I love most. That is not where God wants you to be. God wants you to be set free. That's why he sent his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not, would not perish, but have everlasting life. He came so that you would be set free, amen, from the enemy's grips and shackles. And he wants to break every chain, not just a few chains, but all the chains that the enemy has a grip over you. 
And from, uh, from, a, from an infant, there have been things from, from our teenage years to our young adult years. Right now, some of your teenagers in, in here, you teenagers are dealing with things and struggles. And it was amazing to see some of our young people on Friday night be liberated and set free and crying out to God and saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I can't do it anymore on my own. Lord, take this burden off of me. Seeing people that literally can't get words out of their mouth and a leader saying, say what you need to God right now and her crying out to God and getting what she needed, amen? The enemy wants you to stay mute. The enemy wants you to stay stagnant. The enemy wants you to stay put because he knows that you have ability to be a world changer and a game changer, not just in this church, not just in this city, but in this world. You are called to make a difference and an impact, amen? So get up, not literally, get up like... Get up in your life, amen? Figuratively, get up, dust yourself off and move into the places that God has called you to move into. It's time for us to rise up, to dig deep, right? And to stay ready. My, my friend, Pastor Mike Solorio, he'd always say, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Amen? He'd say all the time, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And I believe we have a room full of people that stay ready, that are in this, in the trenches, doing whatever it takes, sacrificial, and it's hard, but it's worth it. The battle's already won, amen? So let's go in victory today.